Welcome everyone to today's Tuesday Times Roundtable. I'm quite excited to have a whole panel today since global learning is all about multiple perspectives and we'll, we'll have the opportunity to, to hear many perspectives on today's topic. I want to point out one flyer that I left uh, in most of the seats in addition to today, today's article is about our office's transformation contest hosted by the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. It's an opportunity to come to Washington, <coughs> D.C. with me and uh, three other students to specifically learn about globally focused careers in the federal government and nonprofits. These are agencies that deal with international relations and development. There's some more information on there. It takes place uh, sometime the week between spring and summer semester. So um, you can read about it on there on the website. You can let me know if you have any questions about it, but great opportunity. Feel free to tell anyone that you might know that's interested if, if it's not up your career alley, but a great opportunity. I'm going to introduce our prim primary moderator for the day, and then you'll get introduced to everyone else uh, over the course of the roundtable. Um, Dr. Jeanette Cruz has diversified experience working in higher education with an emphasis in student services, multicultural affairs, and missions advising career development, student retention, academic support services, student technologies, at-risk populations, and college enrollment. Originally from Puerto Rico, she obtained her bachelor's in psychology from the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico, a master's degree in counseling from Iowa State University, and completed her doctorate in higher education administration in 2011. While at FIU, she has worked in student affairs, enrollment services, and taught freshman students. Dr. Cruz has also worked at other post-secondary institutions, including Iowa State and the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. Her passion is to serve collegiate students and guide them towards graduation. Thank you, Eric. And that indeed is my passion, be working with uh, um, collegiate students, especially uh, first generation students. And um, how many of you in the audience are first generation students? Can I see a show of hands? All right. Uh, currently, uh, statistics for um, <coughs> FIU, um, they say that we are about 50% uh, of the population of FIU um, collegiate students are first generation. So. Um, that brings a, a special uh, type of uh, um, um, challenges. But today, we are going to be celebrating not only the challenges, but more than the challenges, we're going to be celebrating the achievements. Because uh, <coughs> today, we, have, uh, we are celebrating uh, first generation uh, day and week. And uh, wanted to start with uh, talking about the celebration. So who are first generation students? May I see, uh, maybe you can um, comment on that. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Melanie. Uh, I moved here to the US when I was nine years old. My parents did not attend college when they were in Peru, and I am the first uh, college, I guess, admitted student in my, in my like, primary family. I'm gonna be graduating next semester. Okay, congratulations, Melody. Melody comes uh, from Peru. And her definition, she's the first one in her uh, family to obtain a, a bachelor's uh, degree. Anyone else, another definition that we have? Let me show hands. Okay, basically that's what it is. A uh, first generation student is a student that neither of your uh, parents or in some cases uh, legal guardians, they have received a bachelor's degree so you are the, the first one, you are the trend uh, setters uh, coming to college and navigating all the, the waters and the labyrinth that FIU and any other institution uh, have. As you heard in my presentation, I have worked in uh, three different institutions of higher ed, and all of them present challenges, not only for first generation students, but for um, all students. But um, for first generation, it's uh, particularly um, uh, difficult because they're the first one. They don't have uh, back um, at home, they don't have their parents kind of knowing this is how you do your FAFSA, this is how you uh, fill out your application, this is how you send an email to your uh, professors. So navigating those waters uh, can take some challenges. And here at FIU, we take that very seriously. Uh, we have a significant number of programs that help with uh, first generation students. Some of them um, offer financial assistance, like the first generation scholarship uh, program. I know that uh, 
you know about them through um, academic works. You can always apply there. We have other programs in, uh, in the area of students' access and success. We have programs, bridge programs, that will help students moving from high school um, to college, like the Golden Scholars. Uh, we also have pre-collegiate programs, uh, like Upper Bound, Talent Search, and then once you move into college, we have students like the one that I direct, uh, Student Support Services, and also we have bridge programs that move uh, students into grad school, like uh, the McNair uh, program. So one of the um, strategies to work with first generation student is that we need to identify them early and start working with them early. So that's the importance of a lot of the uh, <coughs> pre-collegiate programs. As you probably also read in the um, New York Times uh, article that, you, um, that is linked to this program, um, that is one of the most successful um, areas of working with um, first generation students is that early um, reach out. Um, I know that um, we have audience here in the uh, panelist presenters that they all be rep uh, talking in details about uh, that experience, but that is very important. Also, you need to involve um, family members into this. Uh, so I know that some of my colleagues, they work together with, uh, they do in the Upper Bound program, they do Saturday sessions, not only for the students, but also for, for parents to uh, kind of navigate with them the waters into uh, what is it for your son or daughter to come to, um, to FIU and any other institution. And then we need to provide, uh, once the students are admitted to college, we need to provide them with a special assistant into, um, it can be in the form of advising and working with them in different areas like um, career development and also providing that um, social um, network, right? So one of the things that, um, that um, one of the main programs that work with first generation students is the TRIO program. How many of you have heard about TRIO before? Let me see hands, some of you, all right? So TRIO programs, they were created um, in 1964. Um, part of the um, Higher Education Act in 1965 to particularly work with first generation students, but also um, combining that with students that have financial challenges, low income first generation. There <coughs> you have two um, barriers and two challenges uh, for students that um, wanted to attend uh, post secondary education. So they created initially uh, three programs. Upper Bound, Talent Search, and Student Support Services. That's where the name of TRIO came about. And I like to explain this because sometimes people think that uh, TRIO is an acronym, um, but it's just because they were the first three programs that the federal government uh, um, put together to particularly assist this population. Today, there are eight programs, and I'm not going to talk in particularly about all of them because that will be another trio session, and we won't do that today. But I wanted to um, um, specifically validate the importance that FIU have in terms of helping this population that among my colleagues uh, nationwide, my trio family, uh, I always go out and say um, FIU have a very strong presence of TRIO programs. As you can see, we have five of the TRIO programs um, in place here at FIU. We have some that work with the students at the pre-collegiate level, like the Talent Search, Upper Bound. We have a second Upper Bound that is dedicated into math and science. We have Student Super Services, and then we have a fabulous uh, McNair program. So wanted to um, mention that. Um, and this year, we are celebrating for the very first time uh, Trio National Trio Day. You all have flyers in your uh, tables. And tomorrow, if you have a chance, please stop by the GC area. You 
can talk directly with each of the programs that help first-generation students here at FIU because we are going to uh, be all together. But today, um, I kind of uh, <coughs> like to give you an overview about what TRIO is and the um, challenges of the first-generation students. But we have prepared something uh, better than me talking to you about the experience. We have uh, a group of panelists that they are all have been beneficiaries of uh, TRIO programs at different points in their life. But for that, I would like to uh, introduce my um, uh, colleague, director of the uh, Magnair program, Steve Fernandez. He was born in uh, Front Royal, Virginia. As a first generation college student, Steve received his Master of Art in Global Affairs along with a BA in International Relations, Political Science, and Geography, including certificates in National Security Studies, European Studies, and Latin American and Caribbean Studies from FIU. Um, uh, and he has been with uh, FIU for a um, couple of years now, working in different capacities, but recently he has been appointed as the director for the Magnair program, Steve Fernandez. Thank you. Let's hear it for Dr. Cruz again. <laughs> As she said, my name is Steve Fernandez. Um, thank you, Dr. Cruz, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's my great honor to introduce today's outstanding panelist. Um, I'm going to go down the list and starting with Dr. Agatha Caraballo. Dr. Caraballo is an educator, public service leader, mother, and wife. She designed and teaches fully online courses and full-time digital instructor, and serves as the director for the Bachelor's in Public Administration program and undergraduate certificate in leadership studies for the Department of Public Administration in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs here at Florida International University. She is the immediate past president of the South Florida chapter of the American Society for Public Administration and presently serves as a treasurer for the ASPA's National Section for Women in <coughs> Public Administration. Within the community, Dr. Caraballo was appointed to the City of Miami's Senior Citizen Advisory Board and Community Advisory Board, serving as chair for the CAB's Community Outreach and Education. Dr. Caraballo was born in Asuncion, Paraguay, to a Brazilian mother and an American father, and was raised in Northern California, where she participated in the Upward Bound TRIO program. She moved to the South Florida area in 1999 and graduated with honors from FIU, earning a Bachelor's of Science in Communication and in 2002, and then her PhD in Public Affairs in 2012. Our next panelist, Timothy Dean, Mr. Dean was a student of the FIU TRIO Upward Bound program in high school and transitioned into the TRIO SSS program while here at FIU. An interesting fact about Mr. Dean was he was able to be a student, a counselor, an assistant director, and now director in the same TRIO Upward Bound program he participated in while in high school. He obtained a bachelor's degree in business and, mark, uh, and a master's degree in criminal justice due to the support he received from his TRIO family. He is the first of his family to go on to college and graduate with a degree. Now, his goal is as director of a TRIO Upward Bound program is to continue to be a beacon of support and resources for first generation students here at FIU. Our next panelist, Kendra Morancy. Ms. Morancy grew up in Naples, Florida and is an FIU graduate in the field of international uh, relations with a focus in Middle Eastern studies and national security. Throughout her four years as an undergraduate here at FIU, she was, a, she was a member of Student Support Services participant and was able to conduct research on human trafficking in Miami-Dade County as part of her involvement as an FIU McNair Program Scholar for 2016. Recently, she was awarded the McNair Graduate Fellowship in the spring of 2017 and continues to do her graduate studies here at FIU and is currently enrolled in the joint MA PhD in African and African Diaspora Studies and International R Relations. Our next panelist, Carlos Pulido. Mr. Pulido is a South Florida native whose family originated from Cuba and Guatemala 
As a first-generation American, he was raised by his grandmother, who instilled him with a value for education and preservation for the natural resources. He is the first member of his family to be educated in an institution of higher learning, and during the fall of 2015, he started working with Dr. Jennifer Geberlein of Florida International University on the Drones, Dogs, and Disease Research Program. He is, in his, as his first research opportunity, he learned firsthand what research was and how it reveals hidden truths. He is a 2017 McNair Scholar who will be graduating this coming fall with a Bachelor's in Environmental Studies and is currently applying to a number of PhD programs all across the country. Our next panelist, Justice Pinkney. Ms. Pinkney is an African American and Puerto Rican senior studying psychology at Florida International University. She is, an SSS, she is both SSS and McNair Fellow, working and finishing her undergraduate degree and is getting ready to apply for PhD programs in higher education across the United States. And last but not least, Albert Jimenez. Mr. Jimenez is a junior majoring in biomedical engineering with the hopes of attending medical school after graduation in 2019. He participated in the Golden Scholars Program and is currently involved with student, uh, student service, support services program here at FIU. Let's hear it for our panelists. Thanks to um, all the panelists. Um, I just feel so proud, you know, knowing all of you from, uh, especially uh, Mr. Dean. I remember when he was uh, uh, a student here at uh, Upper Bound and then an SSS. I just started when I was 10, so that's what I remember <laughs> all that. But anyway, I would like to uh, present a question to all of you. Um, and you can uh, speak uh, briefly about, I um, wanted to know from all of you so you can explain the audience how was your experience as a freshman stu um, student, collegiate student, at any of the institutions that you attended? Maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Caraballo. Um, I attended, well, straight out of school, I was going to go to San Diego State University. That's where I was accepted. Um, but I knew that being raised as a single father, that it was going to be a burden, you know, to be able to pay for housing and everything. Um, so I decided to stay at my local community college, which was Santa Rosa, um, Santa Rosa Junior College in Santa Rosa, California. Um, it's actually right next door to my high school, so it wasn't a huge leap. I literally just had to walk right across the parking lot. Um, but as close as it was, it was a whole new world. Um, and what I appreciate about being in that environment is that my classes, I mean, it ran the gamut from fresh high school graduates like myself. Um, to people who were old enough to be my grandparents and in their 60s and 70s. Um, so knowing that we were all starting this journey together but at different stages of our life, um, I think was really helpful. Um, and I just, I, I learned so much from just being in those environments and getting involved as much as possible, even though I wasn't necessarily going away right away. Um, and I did end up transferring obviously to FIU to finish my degree. Um, but just immersing myself in the college experience um, really helped me make the most of it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me see. My, first, my experience as a freshman at FIU um, was a little challenging at first because it was the adjusting from coming from high school to college, I wasn't there yet. Even though I was a part of the Upper Bound program, I didn't fully took advantage of all the opportunities they gave me. So it was more like a trial and one er error. What I did realize that was um, at the last minute that I didn't ask for help as I needed help because I was scared, because I didn't want the people to believe that I was not as smart as the other students in the room. So I struggled my first semester, especially in college algebra, because I didn't ask for help. But um, with the help of the student support services here, I was able to accomplish that, get past that. And the first year was, was rocky. It took me a while to get into the college atmosphere, college life, but eventually I did graduate, but it took me a while to do it as well. So my, my year experience, it took me a while to adjust to it. Um, I would say I had a similar experience as he did. Even though it was just a two hour drive from my hometown, it was a shock because now you go from your days being planned all day to you having so much free time. So it was a lot of trial and error of, oh, I want to join this organization. I want to join this organization. And through time, I realized that it's your journey. You don't have to have a similar journey as anyone else. So if something doesn't work out for you, just drop it. I wouldn't say like 
don't feel obligated to continue down a path that you don't want to be a part of. And that's what I would say. Um, <clears throat> my, my, my freshman year was also same as, as everyone else. It was kind of rocky at the beginning. It's weird going from high school to, I went to Miami Dade College, so when I'm from high school to Miami Dade, it just felt like high school part two, really. And, um, and it was rocky. I, you know, I didn't know how to navigate school and um, being first generation, you really don't have those resources or kind of like that, that frame as to like where to go. But um, I eventually found my way and it's been going good. Um, my first semester was rough, um, cause all I knew when I was younger, like I always saw my parents struggle is just to work. So as a freshman, I went in also working kind of part time and I loved having the freedom of everything, but I didn't have any guidance as to like what to do and how to do it. When I got to college, I just knew like, all right, these are your responsibilities. I didn't know what questions to ask, how to ask them or anything. I didn't even join SSS until I was a so sophomore which was very funny because I only found out when I picked up that one time the FIU newspaper, which you guys should. But, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, after that, everything just started falling into place because then a year later I joined um, S uh, McNair and um, it's been going really smooth lately. Like just, you got to learn how to accommodate and to cope into college and don't be afraid to ask questions because there are people there willing to help you. For me, I joined with Golden Scholars, and that actually really helped me um, start off my freshman year on the right track. Um, when I moved on to fall, that's when things started getting like a little tougher because classes, you're juggling more club, the clubs that you want to be involved in, and um, having like student support services or um, like a mentor or something to ask for help with um, definitely helped me during that first year and semester as well. Perfect. Going off of that uh, first year theme, um, a question we have here is, if there was an orientation process specifically designed for first generation students, would you attend? And what would you like to see at such an event? Uh, I'd like to open this up to anyone that'd like to answer the question. Uh, I can, I guess I'll do this one. If, to be singled out as a first generation, would I go to that event? I don't think I probably would have because um, there's just so many negative connotations as being a first generation student. So as I'm walking in, everybody know first generation and something else goes along those lines is either you're first generation, you have to be low income as well. Because they usually associate both with together. But if they had to do it, um, I would have tried to see if they can combine it with the orientation with the other class. Uh, have a special session just for them to show them these are the steps that you need to take in order to become a successful college student. And that would have helped me along with other first generation students. I would have attended, but if they'd have had a separate session along with the other students as well. Um, I would agree with him also. Maybe they should incorporate this within um, that long two day orientation we have to do as freshmen or transfer students and maybe not name it first generation and maybe make everyone do it. And when everyone separates into their major fields, maybe have a section where they give us options because I would say as first generation students, we don't know our options really. We just know the main careers that everyone tries to push us into. And then we have this issue of maybe we're not cut out for those careers and we just need options. So if we know at the beginning of our um, journey, it will probably make it way easier. Yeah, um, I definitely agree with Kendra. Um, I mean, for me, I wouldn't be scared to walk into a session, but that's just me. Um, if I feel like the information helps, like I'm definitely willing to hear it. But um, I do feel like that as first-generation students, we do feel like, oh, the first step, get into college, and then after that, we got to find a career that's going to help us take care of our family, right? Like, that's most of what we think. That's what I thought. That's why I wanted to be a doctor at first, but that's definitely not it. But, like, having options definitely would help. Having that workshop or session that tells you, like, you have – all these different kinds of options, all these different kinds of majors and certificates and stuff, you don't have to just stick to the popular ones, you know. No, I agree with all of you. Um, I think that it, there's a lot of the information that would be covered in a first generation workshop that would be of value to all students, um, especially in such an international city. If your parents earned a degree in another country, they still may not be familiar with how 
the education system works here, maybe they don't have experience with financial aid, um, residency requirements, and all the things that go into studying here. And as I mentioned at the beginning of, um, during my um, um, overview of the programs, um, FIU have a, a significant number of first generation students. And I do understand even attending um, regular freshman orientation can be, uh, uh, can create some anxiety to many. Um, I, I go over there to the ballroom and <coughs> I see all the new faces just walking around, uh, not exactly knowing where to go. But I think uh, it's very important as uh, you have heard members of the panel to, to try to challenge yourself and be part of the different programs uh, to get that information. Also, Mr. Dean um, comment uh, on something that is very important. I'd like for you to go with that information uh, when you go out of that door, that uh, sometimes uh, the term uh, first generation um, can be associated with uh, low um, socioeconomic uh, income, right? Uh, because sometimes if parents don't have uh, an, an education, you know, they are uh, living in certain areas, uh, and also that have an impact in the education that students have, which I, we always, uh, and, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce my, my colleague, Ms. Moira Lertora, there in the front, uh, that we say that our students are not uh, prepared, but they are uh, having challenges in the preparation. That doesn't mean that they do not have the intellect to continue um, their education here at FIU. They just need that extra, extra help. So. With that in mind, I wanted to, for you to be very specific in remembering in your um, undergraduate education, and, and for some of you, even in your graduate education, what, have, what was one of the biggest challenges, if you have to identify one, one of the biggest challenges that as a first generation you confront and you um, um, overcome? Uh, I'll start. Um, so for me, it was, um, when, you, when I got to FIU, I was like, okay, well, I like science. Okay, so you like science, what do you want to do? Well, if, you're, if your parents are like, you know, immigrants, they tell you, oh, you, you like science, and you should become an engineer, you should become a doctor, because then you'll, you know, belong part of that caste system, right? You're successful. So I started doing that, majored in biology, and it turns out that I didn't like medicine. I mean, it just wasn't for me. Um... But after like, you know, evaluating and some reflection, I found a, a mentor. And mentor was kind of like the best thing that happened to me. So Dr. Jennifer Gevelein, she was, it's funny because her last name is Dr. Gevelein in German that translates to the, the gift giver. And to me, it was like, oh, you're, you're giving me a gift because you're teaching me about this whole new thing that, that I wasn't aware about. You know, I was like, oh, I didn't know you could work with drones and like work with avocado trees and like, Really, I can do that kind of stuff. That's that's pretty cool, and um, and the mentors, she's like that really guides you into this specific niche that guides you as an individual. There's no one set track. It's everyone has their own tra their own route, you know, their own journey. I had a similar experience that um, probably starting <laughs> around third grade, I was convinced I was going to be a doctor. That's all I wanted to be was a doctor, doctor all the way to my senior year in high school and then did an internship at a hospital and realized after the first week that I wanted nothing to do with medicine and, and the medical field. Um, so I think internships or even volunteering and getting a taste of your field um, early on can save you a lot of time. Um, but my biggest challenge looking back was time management. Um, I was working two jobs. Um, member of a number of different clubs, taking a full load, um, and quite frankly, burning myself out um, and really had to kind of step back, prioritize what was most important to me, and then s schedule, um, not just trying to cram things in and fit things in when it was convenient, just being a little bit more structured, and that definitely helped me. And realizing, again, you can't do everything. That at one point or another, you're going to have to pick and choose what's a priority to you. And uh, one of my biggest struggles, like I mentioned before, was just asking for help. Because, um, like I said, I was scared. I was scared to ask help from the student support services. I was scared to ask for help from the teachers. Scared to ask help from the, the actual students in my classroom who I thought was my friends. So I had to get over that challenge because, um, like most of you, I took a class, realized I, I wanted to be an accountant, took my first accounting class. I failed the first test, then the second test. 
Then the third one, then I was like, you know what, this is not for me. But if I had asked my friends who was actually passing the class to help me through the process and help me study, I believe I would have passed that class. So my biggest challenge was, was asking for help. Hear from the others? Um, one of my biggest struggles in undergrad and even still now in grad, I would say, is um, getting over well, getting over the fact that plan A might not work. So I have to have plan B and C and just try my best at all times because that's what I've learned in undergrad, that a lot of times plan A won't work out. So that's why you have these mentors, if you have any, maybe you should discuss these plans with these mentors like in case, um, for example, at first I didn't wasn't sure about the whole PhD situation, so I applied for masters and PhDs. And when I realized the PhD was a better route for me, I did that instead. So um, let's say um, I really forced this masters situation, I would have been in a worse off situation. So sometimes you have to be able to cope and move forward into your plan B because sometimes that is actually better for you at the end of the day. So I would just say. Um, have all these different options. Use your mentors and your resources to make sure that you can adjust if necessary. For me, um, one of my biggest struggles was my parents, personally. Um, that first year, my dad had left to North Dakota to work to help support us because he was only working at the time. So I left my mom here, and she hadn't been without him for a long time. And me being gone and working, so like I'd be at school that semester from like, seven, eight in the morning till like maybe nine o'clock at night, all 12 hours and I come home and she still expect me to do like all chores and you know, wash the dishes and stuff like that. And it became very strenuous on me. And then him being gone, it became strenuous on her and she started taking things out on me and I got cursed out a lot. And that first semester, like I had an emotional breakdown. I had to go see like a counselor here at FAU. It was really hard for me, but I had like a support system. I had someone to talk to because before I would be like, very bottled up. I wouldn't say anything to anybody. I would just go about my business and try and struggle through my homework and stuff. But once I went and talked to that counselor, she told me like, it's gonna be hard. You just gotta um, find that support system. And for me, it was and still is my boyfriend, but I, um, I learned as I got older to not keep things inside and to actually go and seek out help if I need it. So like, now that I'm a part of SSS, that'd be, you know, Dr. Cruz here, I talk to her about everything and like, you know, it just helps. She knows I like to bottle things inside. I even cried to her one time. It's okay to cry, guys. It happens, your emotions get bottled up, things happen, it's life. But have someone there to catch you when you're, you feel like you're ready to fall. Definitely, I agree with what many have said there. Um, time management for me and not having like even though you don't have you want to go that path there are many paths that you can go um and like as Kendra said like not going through that like one like plan a you follow through plan b what's most important even though you might not do plan a what's most important is that you continue moving forward and don't give up um because in the end, something will work out for you. So, and even the the fact of, um, and I think um, Justice and um, some of you have mentioned, dealing with your parents, um, also explaining them um, why you need to stay at FIU from 9 o'clock in the morning to 11 p.m. because you have different groups uh, that you probably have to do some uh, group study can be a challenge because remember uh, for first generation students, um, uh, parents, they want the best for you. They, they really do. They want you to, to achieve, but they don't know uh, the challenges of, uh, for some of you, sch scheduling physics and calculus too together and what that requires so much time. And you cannot attend Abuelita's birthday on Saturday because you, <laughs> have to be at FIU, can be a challenge, right, to, to uh, kind of explain uh, that to them. So um, I know that we have some other questions around, but um, sometimes if one of you can touch later on about how you have deal with your parents and, and significant others in your life that also, um, you know, they, they claim they, for that attention, 
at time that sometimes you can't. Well, to go off of that, um, many of you mentioned the ideas of these uh, support networks and these mentors. Uh, could you go into a little bit more detail about the importance of mentoring, uh, how these support networks have helped you through the process, and that relationship, developing that relationship? Because I know uh, for many of us, especially with the McNair program and SSS, uh, a big key component is that mentorship process and having so much of a line. So if you could elaborate a little bit about that relationship. Um, more recently, um, when I was doing my PhD program, um, I cannot stress enough how valuable it was to have a study buddy. <laughs> um, to just have somebody who was going through the same thing that I was going through, that we could get together, we could share notes. Um, in one case, sometimes, okay, we would split readings. Okay, I'm going to do this one. You're going to do a study sheet for this one. I'm going to do a study sheet for this one. So we'd both read and then share our notes um, so that you know we could work together that way. Um, and then, again, just having a support note, I mean, when I was doing my program, I mean, obviously I needed to get the buy-in from my husband and my kids because they realized that this was going to be a strain on us. Um, but one thing I kept telling them, this is temporary. Um, the benefits of this are going to be long-term, but we just need to get through this period. I know we're very kind of stretched, but I'm not going to be in school forever, um, but the benefits are going to last a lifetime. Mentors. Um, for me, my current mentor has been like my best support system just because, um, you know, he, he, he has a PhD in biogeochemistry and he's, um, his, name, his name is Dr. Leonard Sinto. He's a wetland biogeochemist. And um, when you talk to him, this guy, he's an extremely intelligent person. And, and um, one day we're driving up to go to the field and do field work in the Everglades. And he told me a story that he didn't start college until he was 24. He's like, really? And he goes to me, yeah, I almost didn't graduate high school. Like I missed like 90 days out of, the, out of, out of the, my senior year. And I was like, are you kidding me? For real? And he said, yeah. And he's like, look, don't, don't, don't ever feel that, you know, maybe you don't, like you don't belong here or what you're doing because you totally do. And like he gave me that support, that encouragement. Like, you know, you, you belong here. Keep doing what you're doing. Just keep chipping away and eventually you'll get there. And that's, 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 the, that's the best thing about having a, a mentor. Plus... It's kind of having ac access to like this um, this network that, as a first generation college student, you don't have access to, right? Like when you're a second generation college student, your parents already have like that kind of framework. Oh, you want to do this? Okay, we're gonna guide you along the way, so, you know. But when you're a first generation college student, you kind of like just navigating the waters on your own, and uh, a mentor really helps like cultivate this your interest, and that that that's really important. For me, um, Dr. Cruz, I was very lucky to have her as my mentor since the very beginning. Um, she really helped me guide my path. Like the thing that she meant mentioned a few minutes ago about um, letting your family know that um, you can't go to that event because you have an exam that day. Um, it's perfectly fine to say that. Um, although they would like you to be there, um, if they want you to succeed, they would... Um, they won't get mad at you for like <laughs> for like missing that event um, and also um, she's helped me choose the right path um, I wasn't sure if um, I wanted to do engineering or pre-med and I was always stuck between the two um, however um, she made me just finally help me decide um, what I enjoyed more she suggested like ways to get more involved in that um, particular field to see which one gathers your interest more. Um, having that really helped me to get to how far I've gone now. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I kind of have two mentors. One's my mentor for McNair. We're still building our relationship. We're getting a little more personal. But my first mentor was Dr. Cruz, like Albert said. Uh, this woman's amazing, let me tell you. Like, when I did, there was this induction ceremony for McNair that I went to, and this woman said the word serendipity, and it just, like, it was, like, flashing lights because that's exactly what it was. I picked up the newspaper, which I never picked up before. Someone said, just pick it up and read it. And I saw the office and all the stuff that they offered, and I visited it. They told me to apply, and Dr. Cruz ended up being my um, advisor. And um, that 
it was she helped me with everything she was like how are everything how's everything make a track for what you think you're going to graduate what classes you think you're going to take we'll go over it together we'll check out this and that oh how's everything how are you in general she'll ask and I'll tell her um and then last fall falls are always the hardest for me let me tell you that um, I was a bio pre-med and I was taking orgo and calculus together. Worst mistake ever, guys, don't do it. Um, I, w- I freaked out because I was falling behind in um, organic chemistry and I really was bad at calculus. So I was crying in my room one day and I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't think I'm going to pass this class. I'm not fit for this. So I went and talked to her and she was like, what are you thinking about doing? And I was like, I'm going to change my major to psychology. She's like, okay, are you going to keep the pre-med track? Is that what you want to do? I was like, I don't think so. So she's like, all right, good. So what you're going to do is you're going to change that, and then you're also going to apply for McNair, and then McNair is going to help you do this and this and that. And it was just like everything lined up one after the other. And I thank her for that because I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for her. I have nothing to do with the comments that they are making. Uh, but um, I, I appreciate your honesty. And, and, and I think not only for first-generation students, but for every student that is here in this audience, it's very important that you identify a, a mentor. You know, that can be a professor, that can be a, a upper uh, classman, someone that is a, a junior or senior that can help you uh, navigate the waters because it's, it's important uh, even like um, for the account, the accounting class experience that you have, only if you knew um, other things that you will um, give advice to uh, freshmen and sophomores that will be so helpful for them from this is the way that you study for this class or this is how you, um, this is the style of this particular professor. Uh, let's, uh, m- let's make sure that you understand that for mentors are very important. And uh, they came in all uh, type of uh, ways, professors, um, even people that work here at different departments, uh, from global learning to the Office of Multicultural Programs and Services, career development. Uh, there are many resources here that you can take advantage of. If I will, um, I've been very fortunate to have some incredible mentors and to um, be a mentor um, for several others. And one thing is that a lot of times we tend to think of a mentor relationship as one way, um, but it really does have to be a give and take. And you have to give, invest in the relationship so that your mentor will be invested in you and they'll believe in you and they'll want to hopefully become a sponsor. And the difference between a mentor and a sponsor is a sponsor is somebody who's going to advocate for you. Um, They're going to put themselves out there to advocate, to help you take your things to the next level. So it's not just guiding you, but giving you that little push, um, perhaps making introductions, letters of recommendation, um, inviting you to events that will really help you to develop and grow. Andrew? I was just going to say also um, with the mentors, these are like real success stories you can actually talk to, not like the ones you hear on TV that seem unrealistic. These are real people at your university that you just have to knock on their door and say, um, I've seen your resume and you've done this and I want to do this one day and they won't turn you away. So that's like um, an instant connection that you can make just by sending an email. That's what I would say. I wanted to ask you um one of the questions here, um, if you have a, let's kind of think about FIU. If you have a power right now uh, to go to the fifth floor in Primera Casa, PC, and knock at the door of uh, President Rosenberg and, and ask him, I need you to do this for first generation students, what will that be? Make a club. I'm sorry, I've been thinking about that all weekend. Yeah, I feel like if um, there was like a club, like a first gen club, something cool like that, um, cause it'd be actual like students that are um, organizing it. It'd be a student body organization, having them as presidents from different majors so that they let everybody that's first generation going into these majors and stuff know that um, like what's out there, like what clubs to join, how to time manage, how to pick your classes, who, what teachers to pick, um, what scholarships and stuff, things are out there, what volunteer opportunities are out there, what helps you become a better, well-rounded student. You know, of course, there'd be like a, 
a faculty member or somebody that's ahead of us, like if we need help, we'll go to them. But like I feel like for freshmen or first com- first generation students that ha- aren't freshmen that haven't like gotten any of this information, it'd still be helpful because um, that's just things we need, life tips. We need everything. Thank you. I think we will have to create a professional development for the faculty and staff here at FIU to make them aware of all the different programs that work with first generation students. So when one of them do come into our classroom and need that help, we can direct them in the, the right way they need to do. Talk to the people in student access and success, talk to impasse, talk to student support services because we developed that relationship with them. So we would give them all the resources that they need. So if we can create a professional development class for faculty and staff members, I think that will help not only the faculty and staff, but all our incoming freshmen uh, who come here to FIU. I personally would like to see more multidisciplinary collaboration. Um, I think having exposure to other fields and other majors um, can help you either kind of reaffirm your own choice, but also to see where your career choice kind of fits into the grander picture, um, but also expose you to other majors that you may want to consider for graduate school. And I need to um, take the opportunity to mention that uh, FIU also, we have the um, first generation scholarship, scholarship fund that um, usually uh, will particularly help students that are first generation. And we have other uh, type of um, scholarship funds. That, uh, for example, I work in the, um, the SSS program is part of the Office of Multicultural Programs and Services. I have my supervisor over there, Dr. Sawyers. Uh, and, and I know that one of her uh, main goals is also to provide um, students not only with the academic, but the financial resources that many of them will uh, need. And out of that office, they also have a couple of um, scholarship funds, including one that is due in two days, the MLK scholarship. How many of you have heard about that? <coughs> OK. You have two days to apply. Um, some of the awards include uh, $2,000 for tuition, books, Adamark have been, is in academic works, and I think is open, open to all FIU students, okay? So don't miss the opportunity to apply for those. Uh, this is networking, and uh, I, I understand as a collegiate student, because I was one, uh, financial resources are usually low, uh, so anything that you can apply, please do. You have two days. The deadline is November 9th. Steve. We spoke about a few of the challenges that first-generation students um, have to overcome. What would be some advice? You know, one bit of advice you would have if you could leave them with one kind of, you need to do this, I wish I could have done this or known this when I started. Um, so if we want to go down. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we can all all of ours. <laughs> I, I, I believe build those relationships. Um, after you actually help, build the relationships that will carry you through your collegiate career, not only just through um, your bachelor's, but all the way through your PhD. So developing those great friendships, those great relationships, that great networking is going to help you pass. Um, I would say don't graduate regretting not doing this some certificate or fellowship or joining an organization because a lot of people graduate and they say, oh, I wish I did that in undergrad. So try not to be in that situation. I agree with what everyone said here. <laughs> um, <laughs> just um, don't afraid to knock on the door, send an email. Hey, I'm interested in your research. That sounds interesting. Can, it, can, can, I, can I do it? Some, you know, be involved some way, somehow. And it doesn't matter where you start off. I mean, just starting off somewhere is where, where, where it matters. That's my advice. <laughs> I feel like this is difficult, but um, know what you want to do, like, kind of immediately, like, volunteer in that field that you think you want to go and see if that's what you want to do. Volunteer every, anywhere, do community service or join a club, see what they're talking about for that major, what is available for that, and see if that's actually what you want to do. Because if not, you're going to be stuck taking all these classes and all these credits for all of what, two years, and by the time you decide what you actually want to do, it's probably going to be too late. You're going to go over excess credit charge and stuff like that. You don't want that to happen. For me, it's make sure you find resources. Um, as everyone mentioned over there, don't give up. Um, find that person that will help you um, get to the path that you want to get to. <clears throat> 
Does anyone in the audience have a particular question for any of the panelists? Be afraid to speak up. <laughs> I read a book last year, and, and in it, some first gener faculty members who were first generation students talked about how um, it became hard to relate to their parents and families after having gone through the collegiate experience. So I know some of you talked about relating to them as students in terms of them understanding the process. But if anyone's comfortable sharing, because I know it's a very personal topic, I was wondering if that is something that um, you might be experiencing. Uh, as well in terms of being part of a whole different academic culture and uh, knowing different things and that, that sort of relating to them. A great question. Who wants to take that one? I have an interesting situation. Since I got my PhD, I suddenly became the go-to person for every question for every topic in my family. <laughs> they suddenly assumed that I was the expert in everything, um, but that's not the case. And my opinion's no more valid than anybody else, especially when it's topics that are not academic. Um, but you do tend to become, suddenly everybody assumes that you're the smartest in the room and tend to bring all your problems and expect you to be able to solve everything. At least that was my experience. Um, I would say um, be strategic in what you say because um, you have to keep in mind that they don't fully understand everything you're going through. So just pick and choose what you say and what you don't say. Just just be aware of what you're saying to who and about what. And if you know that they probably won't support certain things that you wanna do, maybe you should mention it to them, but also keep in mind that they're not in your position too. Um, for me, when I first told my family, like I was studying to become a doctor, <laughs> this is so funny. Every time they got like an ache or a pain, they'd be like, what's this, what's that, what's this? I'm like, I'm not in medical school, guys, I don't even know. That's not what we're learning in class. But um, on a more serious note, like my family is, always been a lot more different than me. They've always done more riskier things. Um, so now that I'm in this whole new world for them, I've, um, I've never been the type to like brag or have my parents brag about me, but like I feel like they look at me as like I'm the kind of know-it-all. Everyone thinks that I'm the like smarty pants of the family, but like I've always tried to like dim down my light. So like my advice, don't ever, you know, dim your light just to make other people shine. You shine as bright as two, you know, like, don't get scared because you're doing something and you're bettering yourself just to make your family feel like they're just as, you know, on the same level as you, you know. And that is important. And, you know, I know we're having this discussion here at uh, FIU, but um, education is key. I always, when I advise uh, um, any of my students probably have heard that I say it's very important that um, you, you pay attention to your little brothers, cousins, neighbors, because they're watching what you're doing, you know. Being the first one, they're, they're trying to kind of follow, you know, what's going on at FIU, uh, this is the person that I'm going to follow, and uh, believe it or not, what you do, uh, uh, the things that you said, uh, how you refer to, you know, challenges and, uh, and achievements that you have at FIU is very important. Uh, uh, I know that uh, Mr. Dean, working with the pre-collegiate program, because you already on the other si side of the fence. But when, I don't know if you remember when you were in high school, kind of thinking, will I be admitted to FIU or not? So that can have, uh, can have some challenges also, not only because of the process, but when you are first generation. I don't know if, uh, I know many of you follow statistics here for the, the state of Florida and Miami-Dade County, but only about 25, 24, 25% of the population of Dade County have bachelor's degree. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. So the fact that all of you have bachelor, uh, some of you have bachelor's degree and some of others are working on, and everybody here working on your bachelor's degree <coughs> uh, is very significant because we know education is the, the key. So have that in mind and, and always feel yourself very special because you're in, in that group. Sometimes when I said that numbers, people like, really? Only 23, only um, nationwide, the number is like 39, all right? So that is the value of your education and what you're doing here is very important. Mr. Fernandez. Any other questions? So one more question for the audience. And
um, an article came out in 2000, in October of 2017, so this year that University of Wisconsin had um, eliminated 40 programs, including majors and minors, and programs in general. Um, and I was wondering how that made uh, first-generation students feel because they use first-generation students sort of as a, um, as a reason for cutting that amount of programs, saying that um, they felt like, that first-generation students felt like it was um, easier for them to choose a major when they didn't have enough programs. How does that make you guys feel? Do you guys think it's easier to choose like have a limited amount of, of programs, or do you guys prefer more options as for ge first generation students? Because I know you guys spoke about a lot um, about options and different things um, that it might be a little bit confusing. I don't know. I was just wondering how that made you guys feel. If you have a less <coughs> selection of uh, mayors, will that make it um, easier or more challenging? I think it would be more challenging. I prefer more options because that way I can well. tailor my interests, you know, my track to my interests. If I have this one A, B, C, D track, then I'd feel very limited. And, and forced. And, yeah, forced. But I want to do that. You know, you'd be spending all this time and money taking these classes you don't really have any interest in, you know? That's like, what's, what's your major right now? Dietetics. What if I told you, um, we only have legal and, um, you know, medical. Which are you going to choose? All right. Like, but do you really want to do that? Like, no, no, no. I was just wondering because it's become very, uh, uh, like a very political sort of argument, and to me, it's very demeaning. It's kind of demeaning yeah. to first generation students. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of wanted to get an idea of what you guys. No, yeah, but that's what it would feel like. Yeah. But it's is the. Um, um, policy that some institutions are taking uh, in terms of uh, reducing the amount of mayors that are offered. I, uh, in particular, have heard, you know, let's eliminate um, anthropology from uh, the, the spectrum of mayors that you can do or, or some others that um, so sometimes because they have low enrollment uh, in those mayors they're trying to eliminate. So those are... Um, interesting um, um, questions and, and obviously areas that uh, I will invite my McNair researchers to do some work mm -hmm. in the area and, uh, and, and put some policy papers out there for the future so we can um, you know, further uh, investigate in the situation. I think um, we're running out of time. I really appreciate um, all of you saying yes to the call when we uh, call you to have a, a panel presentation and also the audience for uh, taking an, an hour of your life and, and coming to these interesting uh, round tables from the uh, New York Times. Thank you, Global Learning, for allowing us to be here. Produced by Academic Video Services within the Division of Information Technology at Florida International University.